Hello, my brothers and sisters. It's Josh Packard. Welcome to another episode of The Golden Image of Churchianity is a Lie. For you that don't know, I want you to know that Jesus has purchased you 100% and holy. You're done. I mean, no matter what anyone says, you're done. See, Satan in the garden offered Eve the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil and said, if you'll eat of this, God knows you'll be like him. You won't surely die. Well, she, seeing the fruit that it was good to eat and to make one wise, she took of it and ate. Well, what she did was she didn't realize that she was already in the image of God. And then by her taking the bait and taking that fruit and eating of it, that she left God's image in search for another that was not clear that she would have to imagine because she was already there. Okay? Likewise, today in the church, you've been saved. But there's somebody acting in the stead of Satan saying, no, 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 if you believe, then you'll be saved. So what they're doing is they're negating the salvation that Christ has already procured for you. And then it have led you astray and pushed you off into the salvation of your own understanding, which is wrong because it's outside of the only true salvation there is, which is Jesus Christ. You have been bought with a price more precious than imaginable. You will never be lost eternally. You're done. You're with the Lord forever. There's no other option. He's purchased you. Well, that being said, we have between here and there, between here and that next life, we've got a life to live here. And God has not left us without hope, and he's not left us without the ability to overcome the wiles of the devil and his agents, being, first of all, the church, the entirety of the church, and every single denomination, and every single one, and every, you know, not church, every religion, philosophy, everything else, that says, if you just do this, you'll get there. That is the lie. That is the fruit that, a that Eve ate, that Adam ate, that damned us all. And we're eating it daily when we submit to the doctrines of, first of all, the church telling you you have to believe to be saved, rather than knowing that you were saved, that you would believe. Everything else is a lie. Christ Jesus is the way, the truth, and life. There is no other way to God but through him. He is it. And the reason it is, is because he cleanses your conscience and sets you free. You know, today I was looking on a news outlet, and uh, Tim Tebow was talking about how he'd rather be known for saving babies than being a Super Bowl champion. I mean, it's, it's minuscule in comparison, he says. And so you get on the comment feed, and everybody's just harping on him how bad a person he is. And it's like, all, you know, how sick and twisted you have to be in order to condemn somebody for doing good. I mean, honestly. So let's take this down through the whole measure of God's plan and economy, knowing that you've been utterly saved, that you will be in the end where Christ is there, you will be too, because he purchased you. Having that in knowledge, now between here and there, now it's a matter of the art of living and how to overcome the wiles and the, the, the destruction and the deception of the wicked one. So we have, again, I know I'm going to beat this to death, but we do have the law and it. It is right, and it tells us how to escape death and how to escape uh, uh, Satan. So that in this world, we can have a wholesome existence. Not only that, we can possess our areas, our lands, where we live. It's just by simple adherence to the Word of God. And I'm talking about his ordinances and statutes, and everybody's going, oh, legalist. Well, I would have said so too, till I understood. Because legalism is literally saying that I'm good because I follow the law. And so or I have some sort of you know, preeminence because I, you know, don't eat meat or, or special meats or I worship on certain days or whatever. That doesn't mean anything as far as your eternal salvation or righteousness before God. And righteousness doesn't mean good. Righteousness means where you feel that you're, you're belong. That's all it is. To be righteous with someone is to be comfortable in their presence. To Like you have the right to be there. That you're family. <coughs> and this is what God has given us. We have this right. So, so it's not about, you can never get that righteousness through the works of the law. It has to be by the word of faith that Christ is your Lord and Savior and that he loves you. So the law can never get you to salvation. The law can never get you to fellowship. The law can never do anything. But it can keep you free from the entanglements of the world, which will keep you in fellowship with the Lord. So when in doubt, the law is there to show you where you can be 
pitfalled and snared by the devil and by, by your neighbors and by everything else. So, so if, when in doubt, you look, okay? You look at the Ten Commandments. They're amazing, and they're extrapolated out. So just so you know, just because it doesn't say it expressly in the Ten Commandments, it is expressly shown in the, the Levitical Law, which is the extrapolation. So adultery, you know, isn't just cheating on your spouse. Adultery is anything that is outside of God's will for sex. Anything outside of marriage, any homosexuality, any LGBTQ, effeminate men, uh, masculine women. I mean, going down the line, these things were all uh, incest, animal sex, you know, bestiality. These things were all fall under that category of adultery. Okay? And I'm just using that as one example. I mean, murdering is not just killing somebody. It's hating somebody. With You know, it's... It's holding grudges and harboring uh, ill will towards people, you know, and you just keep going down the line. It's not just the act. You know, like, you know, when Jesus said even adultery is even looking at a woman with lustfully in your heart. And I'm not saying that because there's no a man on this earth that doesn't look at a beautiful woman and desire her. Um, you know, but that's not, a, again, that's not what the lust is about. The lust is whenever you would desire over your family, where you'd break down your family to go to her. You know, or the grass is so green on the other side that you would you would abandon your family for a woman or something like that. These are the lusts that are damaging. It's not just merely looking at somebody and noticing that they're beautiful. So anyway, um, just so you know, so the law is extrapolated out. And um, the very first law is the most important. And I'm going to read them again because they're just, you, we need to have these indelibly etched in our understanding. And I'm going to go back to Exodus 20, and that's where... Or the first mention of it is given again in, in other places, but um, I just want you to see, just go back to the furthest place back and, and see that it's never changed. And it's always been the same idea. And the very first law is the one that is the most important because without it, the rest of them make no sense. You're still trying to achieve righteousness by your ability and works because you don't understand the first law. And so the first law... Um, is, um, let's just start in 20, 20, 20, uh, Exodus 20, verse 1. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought you out of the land of Egypt. Wait, no, I thought it was your free will. I thought you chose, you made a decision for Christ. That's what happened. You, you, you. <laughs> so he says, I brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Okay? What does this mean? To have no other gods before, before me? Because Islam says they're the same God. Jews say they're worshiping the same God. Christians say they're worshiping the same God. Je Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons. They're all saying that they're worshiping the same God. They'll use the same name. Call them Jesus or Yahweh or whatever they do. They just call them that name. But their attributes are much different as to what their God is and who he is. So the name is not what is important, it's the character and attributes that you attribute to that name, which is important, okay? There's only one God. His name is Yahweh, but, and, and everyone will say, I can say Yahweh, everyone can say Yahweh. It just doesn't mean that there's, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which means he's not the God of the Muslims, the way they think. You know, then you go down, okay, well, he's the God of David. He's the God of, you know, so you know that you're going down through the history. You see Balaam, you see Abimelech, you see even Pharaoh, which they call the Lord, Lord. They call God their God and their Lord. They call him throughout the scriptures, but they're not called out. They weren't, the, the promise wasn't extended to them. They weren't saved. I mean, at that time. So anyway, Let's keep going through because just by merely knowing God's name or knowing him isn't what saves you. It's, it's the belief in the promise which saves you. So let's go through what has God said. Well, the first thing is, is if we see when God makes the covenant with Abraham. When God has Abraham split the, two, to the animals into two piles and then they're like, okay, well, let's go through the covenant. And so God knocks Abraham out and he goes into a deep sleep. And he goes around in a figure eight by himself as a torch in an oven. So God was the witness himself as a unilateral promise. So if, if you have to do something for God in order for he keep him his promise, then your God is not Yahweh. Your God is 
someone else that you call Yahweh, but it is not Yahweh. Look at Adam. When God caused a deep sleep to fall upon him, and then he took the bride from his rib. Well, let's look at Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross and shed the blood in the water, so God put a deep sleep upon Jesus, just like he did upon Adam, in order to make the bride. So again, if you think it's by your free will, by your choice, by your making a decision for Jesus, yep, you know, I made a decision for Christ when I was four. <laughs> no, you didn't. So um, <laughs> anyway, that God that you're worshiping is not Yahweh. His, everything is according to the promises. So if your faith is in his promises, then likely you know Yahweh. If your faith is in your ability to believe or to be a good person or to obey the law or to do any of these things, then your God your, is not Yahweh. You, though you call him Yahweh, or you might call him Jehovah, you might call him God, you might call him Jesus. But that's not the truth. He's not. Because you put the wrong character and attributes upon that name. Okay, so that I have no other gods before him, you've got to see the gospel. You've got to understand that it was by him, for him, and through him. It was the will which he foreordained from the foundation of the world. Let's just get a good glimpse into his character. Let's go to Ephesians, and I'll read it really quickly how many times Paul has to say, say that. I don't know how many times it, uh, he does this just to make you go, what the heck? So, so this is, I can see, I know Paul's exasperation because I have the same, the same deal whenever I'm talking to religious Christians and trying to get them to lay down their law. And so he says, apostle, uh, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, not by his will, not by yours, but by the will of God to the saints, which are at Ephesus and to the faithful of Christ Jesus, grace be unto you in peace from God, our father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto adoption of the children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us us accepted in the blood, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And it just keeps going on and on and on. It's all by him, for him, and through him. He's the initiator. He is the mediator. He is the finisher. He is the alpha and the omega. He is the beginning and the end. It's all him, by him, for him, and through him. His name is the Redeemer God. So if you don't see him as that, and you're putting attributes on him that are not this, then you, my friend, are worshiping another god. If you think you're a good person, you're, you're worshiping your own god. <clears throat> as to why you would get any preeminence before God. If you think this is about being a good person, this is about, you know, I'm just spiritual. You, well... Great. That's wonderful. You can say that all you want. You're still conforming to the image of your God, which you've imagined according to the fashion of your own will and understanding. And then you call him Jesus. Doesn't make him Jesus. Mormon Jesus is not Jesus. I'm sorry, guys. The church, the mainstream Christian religion, their Jesus is not Jesus. I'm sorry. It's not. You put the wrong character and attributes upon that name. It is not him. I don't care how many times you say his name, you pray and say, in your name we pray, in Jesus' name we pray. Oh my God, we, Father God, Father God, every time you pray, doesn't mean shit. If you don't know the correct attributes to put upon him, if you don't give him glory as God, if you don't ascribe unto him that Christ was God in the flesh, that he came and died on the cross, went to the belly of the earth, preached to the captives, rose from the dead, on your behalf, all without you by himself to procure you for his own people and all of creation by himself while we were trying to kill him. While we actually, we did succeed in killing him through the hand of God. Sorry, you guys. If you don't know this simple fact, you're not worshiping Yahweh. You're not worshiping Jesus. You're not. It's a different, it's a completely different God that you've fabricated. 
Okay. You shall not make, and this is the second one, you shall not make unto you, unto you any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water unto the earth. <clears throat> That's the reason why God can't show himself to you yet, or us for that matter. I mean, I can't say that I've seen him. I've heard him many times, but I can't see him. I'm, I'm afraid what it is is that as soon as we see him, we'll try to look like him. And that's not what God's after. He's after you being what he created you to be. And because of our fallen nature, we're going to try to be righteous by looking like him. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? I don't know. All I can know is what I would do when I'm refreshed and washed and set free from my sin. And that's what the Lord wants from me. I'm a specific tool for his operation, and I don't see the operation. So all I can do is be completely ready for him whenever he needs me and completely unemployed from my ideas and understanding. So that whenever he's whenever he needs me, I'm not going to go, well, is that very Christian? I don't know if that's Christian or not. I don't know if I can do it, God. I mean, it's just so stupid. I mean, you guys got to understand. <sighs> okay. You shall not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity upon the, of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. <sighs> so you guys got to understand. If you choose another God over him, you're treading his blood underfoot and counting it as, it as unhallowed and worthy, and you're putting him to an open shame by your, your adherence to doctrines, to theologies, to denominations, to buildings. You're literally trampling the blood of Christ underfoot while professing his name. I mean, honestly, this is stupid. All right? The church is the biggest enemy of God. It's against him entirely. It is, they, the world blasphemes him because of the church. Because the church will encompass sea and land to find one student and make him twofold the son of hell that they are. Sorry, and this is every denomination, every single one. I can't be clear enough. Your church is not accepted. It is your church, your pastor, for the fact that he calls himself a pastor, that he sits up on the podium as pastor, that he's the leader of the church, and that he ascribes himself to some sort of doctrine or some sort of theology, this is to Wesley or to Calvin or to, to Luther or whatever he's going to do, or what's his name, Chuck Smith from... Uh, Calvary Chapel, Pfft. these men did not do anything for you. They didn't die or raise again. They're just men and fallible. So I can tell you right now, they don't even know their heads from their ass. And, they're, and, then, and then the people that follow them, Pfft. Pfft. you guys are doubly stupid. Seriously. Don't like me? I don't care. We stand before God, not before you. I don't care. All right? And I'm going to say this. I love you guys. But then someone's going to watch this and be like, oh, butthurt. Oh, well, he's not very Christian because he said shit. Well, I'm going to say you're not very Christian because you tread the blood of Christ underfoot. You lead people astray. You prevent them from entering the kingdom of God, and you keep your own self out. You. And your word that I said shit or fuck. Mm, God, I, I, I know you're doing it in ignorance, but it, it's still, even though I can preach it to you blue in the face and you're just, you'll call me all these names. It's like, shut them. Just, anyway, but you can't, you can't make somebody understand this until the Lord opens their eyes. It's impossible. And the only hope that they will have for opening their eyes is by preaching the good news to them. Christ has done this. You're saved because he rose. I know it. I don't care whether you made a decision for Christ or whether you believe or not. Christ rose from the dead, therefore you're saved. Whoever you are, now it's a matter of living like you've been saved, escaping the, the depression and rottenness that is in your life, escaping these things, escape the captivity and the bondage and the chains of guilt and sadness and sorrow and regret and self-righteousness and blah, blah, blah down the lines. We can escape it, clean escape. See ya. If you'll just hear the word, the good news that Christ died and rose in your stead and presented you to God without you having to do anything. And then it's the wisdom of God that the, by the foolishness of just merely preaching it to people, this is the power of God. This 
preaching this knowledge to people, just telling them, you have been utterly saved because Christ rose from the dead. Done. Whether they believe it or not, but you've still imparted the word of God to them. It'll do its work. But if you're sitting there and telling people, oh no, you first got to make a decision for Jesus before you're saved. Well, uh, really? Because Christ already saved the world. If you are standing in the way of that, do you think he's going to be totally great with you? He's going to be totally happy? I don't think so. So, my brothers and sisters, you got to completely, completely, completely rethink your thinking when it comes to this. If you're calling Jesus, Jesus, are you sure you're talking about the right Jesus? Because I'm telling you right now, if you're part of the church or Mormonism or, or Jehovah's Witnesses or, or anywhere, you're not talking about the same Jesus I'm talking about. I'm not even close. You're, just because you throw a name Jesus doesn't mean that it's Jesus. So, anyway. Um... You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. And this is what I was just explaining. If you say you believe the Lord and then you've put yourself under his yoke, yet you tread his blood underfoot, God's not going to release you. You're going to still be dominated by your sin. All your decisions will be because of your sin. All your See, what happens is people think that sinners are only just bad. Oh, yeah, sinners, those sinners, they go out and have sex and do drugs and have tattoos and blah, 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 blah. But they don't realize the other side of sinners. The other side is people who are underneath the dominion of sin try to be really good, really Christian-y, really, really self-righteous, really, really pompous. They look like they're such good people, and those poor Christians, I pray for them. I weep for the lost. <laughs> And I hear this on the radio every day, these pastors with straight faces and with such conviction. Oh, well, they didn't make, they need to make a decision for Christ. What they leave out is, like I did. They've, they've got to make a choice for Jesus, like I did. They leave that part out, though. Oh, well, those, you know, because, you know, people go to hell because they don't believe in Jesus, like I did. Yeah. Anyway. It, it, it's such profanity. It is such utter nonsense. It is such self-righteousness. No wonder the world is so confused because what should be free, you put cost to, and the wages of sin is death. Not the sin, it's the wages of sin is death. Well, everybody's like, oh, well, no, see, sin is sin's death. Well, no, it's the wages. But the free gift of God is eternal life. So rather than looking at those two words and comparing death and life, rather look at wages versus free gift. This is what you're missing. This is what you're missing in your wages of sin. And you're teaching other people to pay those same wages that you couldn't pay because you don't believe in Jesus. The Jesus you make the one is you, the one that you believe in is the one that you've made or fabricated. Or what's worse is you've allowed somebody else to fabricate it for you, and then you fell down before it. What kind of loser are you? I mean, honestly, I'm not saying that to be a dick to you. Wake your eyes up. Look, look what you're doing. And then I'm a cult leader, yeah, because I profess nothing but Christ. I don't care about your doctrine. I don't believe what you believe. I am not a Christian. I don't care. You guys are so full of shit. Your eyes are brown. Okay? I'm just... I'm going off a little bit today, but for damn good reason. So I'm just sitting there going, man, going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Sorry, guys. But a Christian is the church. Anyway, we can go down the list forever. But... <clears throat> Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. In it you shall not do any work. Because that's where the free gift is. So if you're still earning them wages, you have not received Christ. You have not made a decision for Jesus. If you're still guilting yourself into conformance, you're still beating yourself up and trying to conform yourself to an image that you have imagined, 
those wages are death. Sin has dominion over you, even though you're a good Christian and you're going to church every Sunday. Sin dominates you, and because it dominates you, you have assented to the fact that Christ is worthless, that his blood was worthless, everything he did on the cross was worthless, everything. And then on top of that, you acknowledge Satan's accusation and that Satan should be listened to and acknowledged and adhered to. You lift him up in, in order to make yourself righteous over God because you denied the blood that bought you. All right, my brothers and sisters. I'm sorry, I hope that wasn't too much of a downer. I mean, to those that you, of you who believe like I do, that's going to be a nice little jolt and a kick in the ass today. It's going to be a good one. For you that don't believe like we do, that's just going to piss you off. You're going to piss and moan all day, hopefully. But hopefully you think about this. <clears throat> hopefully you... Hopefully you can overcome. I'm telling you, it's not to make you look stupid. Well, I am, actually. But it's not for the purpose you think. I'm not trying to exalt myself over you, though I am over you. Um, but what I'm trying to do is get you to wake up and get out of that to where everyone hears the same. I don't need your pastor. Your pastor means nothing to me. Absolutely nothing. He's a pastor, you know, ordained of men. <laughs> what does that mean to me? A piece of paper? Pff. And likely if someone is going to a seminary, and they had the intention of becoming this whole thing, going through four years. They have, they have there's other issues at hand. They, they like the the people patting them on the back. They like the pastor groupies, which you know I do too. I mean, if I was a pastor, that'd be great. But um, they love all the people pat them on the back, putting them in the nice seats in the marketplace. They love people to say, "Oh, pastor, pastor," or "Rabbi, rabbi." They love to sit in the places of preeminence and the people to surround themselves and respect and they like all this stuff and people to introduce them as these godly people and who wouldn't honestly your flesh desires that my flesh desires that I love it but what expense you really really will have to convince me and if you're going to come with, at me with an argument and tell me how wrong I am you're going to have to first of all show me how I'm offending God Yahweh Jesus Christ how am I offending him? If I offend you, I don't care. Your doctrines are what you grew up believing. I don't care. Okay? Well, you guys have a wonderful day. You are loved more than you can imagine. Lay down your works and enjoy life. Enjoy Christ. Keep yourself in the Lord and obey the commandments and the ordinances to the best of your ability. Okay? Abstain from all these things. Abstain from things that corrupt your life. Enjoy your life. Don't allow stuff that corrupts you to come into your family and into your life anymore. Try to get rid of alcohol the best you can do. Get rid of alcohol and cigarettes and drugs and marijuana and Everything you can do, because you're a free Christian, I can do. You can. You're not going to be kicked out of the kingdom of heaven, but you're going to suffer the consequences on this earth, and you're leading other people to them consequences. So do what you can. I mean, it's to the best of your ability. No one's perfect, and, and no one can overcome, and some of these things are beyond our ability to do. I can't be a celibate my entire life. You know, I can't, um, you know, I, I got to eat my bacon. No, I mean, you know, but going down the list, I mean, but the cleaner my life has become, the more wholesome I, I have become, the more joyful my life is, and the more my family responds, and the more blessed they are, and the people around me. So, anyway, do your best to not use things, to fill your heart, and to medicate yourself, rather than drawing near to the Lord, and using Him as your medication, and Him as your healing, okay? All right, you guys, have a wonderful day. Get into some trouble out there and uh, help these religious bastards. All right, see you.